Oh, okay. So um, at which point it's just like, uh, okay, so what do I do? So this is where we get into the, uh, uh, the culture uh, map itself, because this idea was maybe we could use maps, but how on earth do you map culture? So fortunately um, for me, uh, John Cuttlefish uh, did this graph basically uh, of various different components. And he was talking, you know, the iron triangle is dead, uh, the, the illusion of the single, singular organizational culture. And he's talking about issues of diversity, growth and safety and so forth. And so this, this is a, a graph, but it gave me a starting point to think about these terms. And I knew that when we talked about values, the values weren't constant, okay? So Edgar Schein talked about changing nature of values from espoused values to assumptions to unconscious responses. And Oliver Curry had talked about seven universal values. So these values are values which have just become accepted in, in most collectives or organizations. Uh, things like family and loyalty, reciprocity and bravery, and respect and fairness and property. These are, these are beliefs in these things, they're values. So what I did was I started looking at the math and go, well, look, I can take any of these, these uh, terms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start looking at values, but the axis at the bottom, for stage one, I'm going to use the word concept. And for stage two, I'm going to talk about an emerging value. And stage three, a converging value. And stage four, I'm just going to use the word accepted. So I started mapping out things. You know, where was universal basic income? Uh, the belief in it? Um, yeah, it's more of emerging. Paid holiday. There's that. Unionization. Anti-discrimination law. Civil rights and workers' rights. Now, we might disagree with the exact placement, but, you know, that's the purpose of a map, is to put the assumptions down so others can challenge. And so I started digging more into this in terms of legal history and legal structures, etc. And, you know, going through, um, and Marion was sharing an example, I've done exactly the same thing of going through documents and identifying, literally graphing out components. And in my case, it was legal structure. And so I would come across things like, you know, uh, Martin Luther King's talk about the twin pillars of democracy, the uh, workers' rights and civil rights. And the interesting thing about, you know, the civil rights, we know the connection back to slavery, but also uh, workers' rights came from uh, the, uh, the Knights of Labour, uh, which was uh, an organisation which um, also came out of the uh, abolition movement and argued for um, uh, freedom from economic slavery. And uh, uh, this is one of their, their uh, picture, of, well, uh, uh, drawings from their earlier meetings. So what we had was uh, you had universal paid holiday, unionization, workers' rights, civil rights, connected back to abolition, connected to concepts of reciprocity and fairness. Now, all of these uh, values aren't static. They didn't just suddenly appear. They, 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 they started as a concept. Then they started to emerge in society, converge, and, and eventually, uh, well, hopefully, become accepted. And so what I did is I, I compressed these values down. I just flattened, that's all, and just put a square. And that square means a pipeline. So when I'm talking about values, what we're talking about is a constant evolving set of beliefs. Um, so there's new concepts appearing um, and um, some of them will evolve and some of them will eventually become accepted. But, but how do they evolve? Because the process of evolution depends on competition. So, so why? Do values evolve? Well, those values um, belong to collectives. And we belong to many collectives. And some we understand well, some less so. So collectives are things like um, your football club, if you belong to a football club. Uh, your family, if you belong, if you have a family. Uh, your, 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 your church, if you belong to a church. Your nation, uh, your, the company you work for. We belong at any one moment in time to many different collectives. And all of those collectives have values. Okay, but that still doesn't explain why those values are evolving. Well, um, 
some of those collectives are in competition. They have different values. And it's the process of that competition um, which some collectives succeed and their values therefore evolve and some disappear. So now what I've got is a pipeline of different uh, collectives, uh, concept of success and competition, and uh, um, a pipeline of values. And of course, in competition, what we know are the principles matter, and principles are, you know, the doctrine is a pipeline because some of them are a little bit more developed than others. And of course, as every time technology evolves, we get this co-evolution of practice, and out of that, we also get some new principles. And they will evolve. And so what I decided doing is using that as the basis, started to map outwards. And this is where I ended up. So starting from a, a basis of, at the very top, the two anchors are we and me. So all of us have elements of me and elements of we, as in a, a individualist and collective nature, uh, nature. And none of us are truly one or the other. We normally have a bit of both. And the me is, of course, concerned about the individual and agency of the individual. Okay? And that, 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 that agency, that power matters in competition with others. If there is no competition, there is no power. Um, the we is about belonging to the collective. And again, it's about control of the environment. But it's, it's collective, control as a collective rather than agency of the individual. And of course, that, that control needs a sense of belonging to the collective as well. And of course, the individual, there's another concern they have, which is structure. So uh, the individual is often parts of that collective, uh, different collectives. And so they have a concern uh, about the uh, structure and their position within it. All right. Uh, the collective obviously needs to succeed in spreading its values. If it doesn't succeed in spreading its values, it dies off. Um, and in order to do this, you know, it's going to need certain types of behavior that support its need. We're going to have, um, you know, in order to succeed, you've got to be in competition with others. Okay? Otherwise, you're not succeeding, you're not doing anything, you're not going anywhere. Uh, competition is the driving force of uh, evolution. Um, competition depends upon things like your, your principles, your structure. But it also impacts things like your, your the memory of uh, uh, the collective memory of the organization. We, we remember um, being how we dealt with or we were in competition or our success or failure against one or another. Um, there's a link between also values and doctrine, which is called enablement systems. So um, enablement systems are mechanisms for spreading our values. So this could be uh, a newsletter, a, a town hall, it could be a, a use of propaganda, uh, an internet podcast, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and of course, you know, that needs uh, prince, uh, doctrine as well. So if you, you, if you look at doctrine, you have things like um, uh, um, common language. You know, there's no point in, you know, broadcasting things if nobody understands what you're saying. Now, your memory, it gets embedded in things like symbols, rituals, and heroes. And on top of that, we also have this issue of safety. So the sense of belonging to a collective also needs a sense of safety. And that's um, often psychological safety. And that, of course, will be influenced by the memory. So if you, if you think of the organization as an unsafe or a failing place to be, you, you, you may not feel particularly safe uh, in, in terms of uh, discussing and communication. And you've also got gameplay. So things like um, your value and your doctrines can be influenced by your landscape. So remember I talked about, you've got two different types of values, the exclusive and the non-exclusive. So the non-exclusive people over process, process over people beliefs can operate at the same time, depending upon your landscape, or one could be more dominant or the other. And gameplay is all context specific as well. Um, and so gameplay influences competition, um, but it's also influenced by values as well. So for example, um, gameplay to misdirect people uh, might not be possible in an organization which values honesty. So the first thing is you start to note is there's no such thing as one culture. It's not singular because we all belong to many collectives. 
Uh, in order for us to have individually the same culture, we'd have to belong in exactly uh, the same uh, collectives. We'd have to have exactly the same memory. Um, it just just would not be possible. So um, you're never talking one culture. There are many cultures in any organization, not only the ones it creates, but in terms of its nation, uh, a state that it belongs to, and many other factors. Uh, the second thing is, you just can't copy values and structure and magically expect your culture to be the same. So you read these wonderful books about how to go from good to great and all the rest of it. Here's your top 10 things of value. If you just implement them, you'll create a wonderful culture and it'll be perfect because there's so many other components involved. Okay, You can't just go look at Spotify and go, oh, we should copy their structure, copy some of their values and bang, we'll be like Spotify. Okay, but you can adopt. So you can take the doctrine as universally useful principles and you can apply them to yourself. And, you know, this goes back to the competition. I mean, if you're in competition with the other people, if your doctrine is lousy, if you want to get better, improve your doctrine. Um, you know, if all your competitors are lousy, there's no pressure to do so. And of course, remember, if you do improve your doctrine, uh, then others might start changing as well. Okay. Um, but the application of doctrine will also depend upon landscape. So if we're talking about uh, focus on users, um, depends on who you, you know, your users will be different depending on what on which industry we're talking about. Um, the other thing you start to learn is their feedback loops. So, um, you know, this concept of safety um, uh, depends upon, you know, a set, you know, belonging needs of this concept of safety. Um, and uh, um, as in you belong to this collective and you feel safe in this collective and both of that safety and the collective are connected through behavior to values. So it's possible to get positive reinforcing values, uh, which, you know, reinforce this feeling of safety and belonging and strength in the collective. But at the same time, those could be negative as well. So if you get a wrong, a poor set of values, uh, well, sorry, a poor set of behaviours. Um, you know, we have a bunch of values and our behaviours don't, don't uh, reflect that. Um, then we can undermine the entire structure. But that, that can be used in um, uh, both um, for yourself in terms of proving organisations. It could also be used in attacking means. So if you want to go and attack another organisation, um, you just have to start showing examples of, you know, the collectives where the behaviours do not represent the values that they uh, they stand for. So, you know, find the various heads of the uh, uh, organisation or whatever it happens to be and demonstrate that their behaviours don't fit the values. And that will undermine that sense of belonging and safety within that organisation. Um, and you can also use this in other very sort of negative ways. Uh, I, I, I like this um, nearly half Twitter accounts pushing to reopen uh, America, maybe bots. Uh, one of the things I've noticed, uh, and there's a particular online hashtag called Scum Media. And it's, uh, it's, it's, all, it's all about how we should defund the BBC and how the media is incredibly biased and all the rest of it as well. Um, and it seems to have been started by a number of uh, bot networks, um, just basically reinforcing certain messaging. And some people um, obviously have got involved and some of them had questionable and dubious uh, views. But what seems to be happening is that um, more extreme views get dropped in. And sometimes those real people seem to respond with um, uh, more slightly more extreme views and every time they do they get huge numbers of likes and I, I suspect this is also um, uh, being automated it's the industrialization of radicalization so you so see you, so in the space of a few months you know I've seen people going from the point of view of talking about um, uh, dissatisfaction or you know unfairness about something to you know um, inciting a rebellion and um, really pretty offensive views. Uh, they've been radicalized in public, uh, online, um, because they've been, uh, I'm sure they're convinced they're surrounded by real people, but, but uh, I'm afraid most of us are stuck in bot networks. Um, 
So the other thing, um, and by the way, that could be used for good or bad. You know, obviously radicalization is bad at the moment, but uh, there may be the potential to reverse that process to, to, because we're talking about nudging behavior in certain directions. Um, and so things like various uh, comments and the capability of retweeting and putting likes can be used to influence people. So the other thing that you find, whoops. Oh, we, yeah. we do have a question in the, uh, in the chat here. Um, oh, okay, okay. About the last section. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let me see if I can find the chat. Uh, hang on a second. Well, it's always finished this. And I can't see the chat at the moment. So uh, if you want to tell me what the question is. <laughs> thank you. Sure. It says, art provides inner subjectivity, carrying capacity. Uh, those things cannot be easily articulated or the language to describe those things does not yet exist. If art as a representation of culture, or if art is a representation of cu culture, how is art represented on your map? So, For example, so, there's... No, no, I totally understand. So I had this conversation actually at the Hayes Festival, uh, and it's really interesting because um, uh, the, this map is a very imperfect representation of the space. So it doesn't contain everything by a long shot. And one of them uh, it doesn't contain is the concept of beauty and the concept of art. So I'm at the moment fiddling with that one at the moment. It's not on this yet because I'm, I'm not happy with that concept at this moment. But it, it's a perfectly valid point. But at the same time, uh, this map is not, uh, as with all maps, and it, it's an imperfect representation of the space. And the reason why I'm putting it out there is because I want people to ask those questions and put that challenge. And if possible, also find better ways of representing it. Does that answer the question? Um, we'll have to wait for them to say. <laughs> okay, good, right. So, so the next thing you learn is that you have constraints. Um, so for example, you know, the gameplay that you can choose uh, depends upon, you know, not only the competition you have, but also the values of your organization. And then you start to realize you have to think carefully because as individuals, your behavior, uh, um, if it doesn't match the values of the organization in whatever way, can become embedded in memory. And so, so the typical one is the Dominic Cummings one, which is still rumbling today. And of course, that um, can also limit uh, the gameplay the organization has, um, particularly if the collective is starting, people are starting to question whether it's successful or whether it's starting to fail. So it was quite interesting that you've got this challenge going on and this idea of one rule to the elite. And at the same time, uh, the Conservative Party are having to firmly stand there and saying they did nothing wrong. Well, they've got no choice but to say that nothing wrong was done. Because if they're starting to seem as failing, that starts to get embedded in that memory of that organization. So they've taken the approach of, no, we're not going to uh, be seen as failing. But then that has a problem, uh, is that, you know, that can start to affect the that memory, the feeling of safety of people within that organization. And so you suddenly start getting uh, uh, MPs going, well, I can't be part of this, or whatever, whatever it happens to be coming out and speaking up against them. So that's where I've got to. And like all maps, this is an imperfect representation of the space. This is a map of France, it's not a perfect map of France. In order to be a perfect map, it would have to be one-to-one -one scale. Um, uh, I, it would have to be France. Um, and of course that would be useless and, as a map. But despite being an imperfect representation and certainly uh, by, despite having things currently missing, like the concept of beauty, which I'm looking at at this moment, and the concept of art, um, uh, there are many other things that need to be added to the map. It's a starting point for a discussion. And at that point, I will stop sharing my slides and start answering, answering questions. Thoughts? Actually, would it help if I put the slide? I, I, for some reason, I can't see 
uh, the comments at the same time as putting my slides up. That's a problem on my side. So sorry, I'm going to look away from the camera because it's on my laptop. Oh, actually, if I move this over here. Hi, Simon. Hi. Uh, my name is Vin. Um, I'm, re I'm relatively new to Wally Maps. Um, okay. I'll just refer back to your doctrine page where um, you've shown it a couple of times now where you have the financial sector banking. And yeah. you're, you're, you made a statement that um, if it's all bad, then it's okay. As long as everybody else is bad, yeah. I, I don't quite understand that statement because do, do, it, do, do you not strive to have everything green? Oh, okay. No, no. Okay. That's a really good point. So ideally you'd have everything green. Okay. Um, but you know, people look at it. So, so I, I've sat there in various financial companies and gone through it and it's all red and they're, they're like, oh my God, we're terrible. How do we survive? And the reality is they survive because everybody else is red as well. Um, so when we, you know, people often talk about Darwinism, survival of the fittest. Yeah, well, often it's a case of survival of the least incompetent. As in, you know, we'll imagine we're running away from the bear and we've all got concrete shoes on. I mean, ideally, we wouldn't have concrete shoes on. But as long as everybody has got concrete shoes on, you're not at any advantage or disadvantage to anybody else. Now, obviously, it would be, uh, it would be nice to strive to, to improve and become more green um, and be more competitive. Uh, but most organizations are far away from that. So um, the reason why I, I say this is to really stop people from panicking. Um, and, and, you know, just if your organization is really poor at the doctrine, you know, it's okay um, if everybody else is. Does that make sense now? Yes, thank you. Okay, and so one of the things that does happen is um, people often come to me and say, we're going to put the pioneer settler town plan because people like to reorg things. And so I have to spend a lot of time saying to people, you know, don't go near that structure uh, until you've got your doctrine sorted because it will fail. Every time I've seen people do pioneer settler town plan, if the principles are their doctrine is, is not very good, they failed and failed miserably. Uh, um, and those where it's worked and it's worked very, very well um, are only those whose principles are pretty much uh, good across the board so um uh, but people often it's like being on the titanic and there's a big hole in the side of the boat and people want to me mess around with shifting the deck chairs about i mean the, really you've got to fix the big hole and so the doctrine your principles of the big hole fix that before you do the real and certainly before you start messing around and playing with culture and things like that and to do, do that basic first um but of course you know, people like to announce big real orgs I don't know why we, we like reorgs. I'm um, never, never sure, but there we are. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, any, oh, I've got some questions. I have a couple of colleagues who would have loved to join but unable to. Will this be recorded? I don't know. Was this recorded? It was, but not from the beginning, Red. It was the main oh. bit was recorded. Oh, was it? Okay, fine. We, we missed the exciting bit at the beginning. That's all right. Not a problem. Like a wine, I suppose. It's the flavor, not the content. Well, that's an interesting quote. Um, I cannot hear. I cannot hear. Is it only me? Gosh, did you? Can you all hear me clearly? Or was, uh, have I been dreadfully? Has the audio been a bit, bit rubbish at all? That sounds good. Oh, we, can, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, good. Right. Well, um, um, okay. Uh, and a while ago, I can John Cutler. His Twitter handle is John Cuttlefish. Yes, yes. Um, uh, I, I am great thanks. He, he drew this sort of uh, graph, and it was just like, ah, okay. Well, we, uh, what happens if we start thinking about these components uh, in, in a mapping sense? Um, or oh, John Grant. Hello, John. Uh, art provides intersubjectivity, carrying capacity. Yep. Uh, those things cannot be easily articulated on the language to describe those things does not yet exist. If art is a representing, how is art representing the map? And the answer, John, is it's not there yet, um, but we've got to find a way of putting it on there. Uh, concepts like beauty and all the rest of it as well. I haven't worked that one out. i uh, be very happy if someone could do that for me. Um, uh, there is no link between agency and enablement. Let me go back. Well, you know, John knows this very well. This is uh, um, 
John, by the way, um, provide and uh, does the awesome list for mapping and everything else. Uh, he, he's a, a huge member of the mapping community. So real pleasure to see you here, John. Um, if I have a look at, I'm just gonna share that screen again. Okay, so John was talking about the need for a link between um, oops, let's have a look. Annotate. Is that going to let me annotate? So I'll put this over here. Fine, it is. Right. Clear. Oops. So, John, you want a link between that and enablement systems. John, you want to come off the microphone or come so I can hear you because I can't see you. John, are you still there? Yes. Um, oh, hello, John. So I'm absorbing what you're saying about feedback loops. Yeah. Maps, which I think are fascinating. But looking again at this map here, there isn't yeah. a flow between agency and enablement. Yeah. So wouldn't be any feedback. Now, the reason I'm saying there should be a link is because art is a byproduct of agency, human agency, whether it's visual, um, poetry, language, uh, anything that's in that. And you mentioned before with enablement, it's anything that can do that. So town halls. Yeah, no, no, that's really, that's a really interesting idea, John. Um, so we're, we're gonna, uh, we'll have some sort of part because that's also, oops, oh God, I'm so useless. And uh, uh, one of these days I, I will learn to be uh, able to draw. Uh, but what you're talking about, see, I've got symbols down there in memory as well. But there's also a connection. You mean it's like a connection from here up to here. And that's a that's actually a, a square, so it's a pipeline in connection to enablement. Okay, that's is that's the sort of thing you're talking about. Well, as you know, I don't have a background in humanities. <laughs> I'm a soft, software engineer by training, but I'm reflecting what Dave Snowden, I think, has said yeah. that actually music be came before language. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's a really oh gosh, that's a really interesting idea. Uh, the reason being is that obviously art it needs some sort of mechanism of distribution, uh, uh, whether it is in terms of uh, you know, your town hall, your your, your podcast, or whether it's your propaganda, your, you know, your posters or whatever it happens to be. Um, now, is it agency of the individual or is it, uh, you know, is it about the individual or is it collect connected to the collective itself? Like that. I'm worrying I've lost John. I was thinking about how, oh, sorry. No, no, go for it. This all just kind of made me think about how, um, and it's slightly unrelated to the art angle, but Cambridge Analytica seemed to take a lot of the different um, principles that were here and put it together with um, like thousands and thousands of data points um, mm -hmm. to come up with something that was actually useful for social engineering on a on a larger scale than what's been done before mm. any thoughts on how um or on uh i guess that kind of thing like uh, you were talking about botnets well if if bots were used to be able to um take in and uh pull the information together for these different areas um 
and produce things like that, it would create its own type of security issues. Um, yeah. You know. I mean, um, you know, there's entire new vectors of attack. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I uh, create a botnet against the company. All I have to do is get people with slightly negative views about that company, create an artificial collective, invite them in with hundreds of other people sharing similar, slightly negative views. In fact, it's not really hundreds of other people, it's 99 bots plus them, or whatever it happens to be. And so they're now in the safety of this artificial collective, which is complaining about this company and a few more, get a few more humans to, to join in, and then drop a few more little uh, teaser, more extreme messages. And of course, you're monitoring all the time. And every time they say a slightly more extreme thing against the company, then they get 66 likes or whatever it happens to be. And so in the process, that process, through that creation of that artificial collective. So if I draw this on here, um, let's change colors. Because uh, first thing, I want to remember that art thing. Um, uh, da -da, da -da 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 -da. There's one. One last point I'd like to make, which is linked to the comments that were just made. Yeah. And I was thinking about a response, and that's to do with AI and the research that's going on with our AI to actually create music or to create art. Yeah. When you look at what they're trying to do or the process that they're using, so there's, in machine learning, there's two types, the supervised and unsupervised learning. Sure, yeah. Well, the art is supervised learning. They take data of music that people like and they somehow create models that can create new versions that humans should like. But in a way, it's exactly what you've just said about Twitter. It's about manipulating the response of humans. So agency is always key because it's about how a human responds or the emotional response of a human to a thing, okay. whether it's made by machines, made by one person, John Lennon, a poet, or made by a collective, the Beatles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or an orchestra. Mm -hmm. At some point we start to realize that now we're only the biochemical and electrical components of, <laughs> um, of an actual machine, AI, that lives everywhere or something. <laughs> oh yes, we're part of a greater AI, yes. Okay, so um, a number of different interesting ideas then. Um, and particularly I'm election. kidding about that, but you know, in a sense, Are you? It's also, Are it's, you? in a sense, philosophically, it's also somewhat the way things are functioning. As you were, as you were saying, you're stuck there in the middle of this botnet. Yeah. With all these bots talking to you, you're the biological, chemical, electrical, component in the middle there you're the one that they communicate the emotion through but the the interesting thing of course is as more people join and as soon as you've radicalized enough people the box can withdraw and the humans will do it to themselves oh yeah yeah so so it, it, it's almost like the seeding so you could use that as an attack vector against a, another company um and uh, Take a bunch of people who had slightly negative views and turn them into total extremists against their, their company, manipulate them in that space. It should be possible. Uh, it certainly seems to be going on, particularly in the area of, uh, uh, um, uh, seriously, right wing, extreme right wing policies uh, or, or, or rhetoric, I should say. It's certainly happening in that space. And then there's the other side, which is the whole art and the symbol is associated collectively with collectives and the involvement of individuals in the art. Um, all right, I need to screenshot this actually because I need to noodle on this. Uh, I sent you that to Twitter if you wanted, Simon, mm -hmm. uh, as a Twitter message. Oh, thank you. I mean, um, yeah, that, that, that's a really interesting one. Uh, and, uh, and thank you, that's really, really appreciated. Um, any other comments? Does it all seem like this? You see, I, I oh. find, sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, so the question I have here is that, so this map that you have there now is a yeah. map of 
let's say, the current status quo, right? Where you believe, or, you know, again, it, we can agree on, disagree on some of the points, but you kind of mapped where, you know, the industry kind of is. If I was going to apply this, for yeah. example, to a company, organization, yeah. will I, won't I start with every one of those, you know, items on the left? Okay. And then, um, and then see, you know, and, and see the evolution, right? Okay. So, uh, what this is is a map. Th this is culture itself. So this is uh, because I uh, I can't describe culture in words. There is culture. Uh, this is culture. It is a description, but it's a oh, sorry, it's a map of culture. Uh, to convert that into words would be huge numbers of words. Um, now. Um, where I've got pipelines, what I'm saying is there are many components on the left and some evolve more on the right. Uh, where I put the square box is basically for that concept itself, where are we roughly in the industry? We sort of understand collectives. We're not bad at structure, behavior and values. Well, values are you know, not, not great on, not as good as collectives because we keep on confusing uh, principles with values. Enablement systems, we understand the individual, but do we really understand not the memory? Yeah, we're not bad on organizational memory. We know we remember things. Uh, gameplay, uh, we, we were terrible uh, in the concept of gameplay. I mean, we do these lovely, wonderful talks and everything else in terms of uh, uh, how strategic we are, but most of it is just made up anyway. Um, so I put things where I think they are, but of course, you know, it's a map. So people might say, actually, that thing is a lot more understood and a lot more accepted, um, a lot more commodity uh, than you've described it. Um, so this is my opening gambit. It's like, yeah, it's it's like, like, if I was going to map a company or a culture, let's say I want to map a particular culture yeah. in one particular moment in time, yeah, yeah. I'll start on the left. So for example, let's say an organization has no memory. It doesn't, doesn't put any effort on it. It has not captured oh. So you could say that the memory can start as a concept for yeah. that particular organization. I, I, the first thing I would say, you said, I, I want to start using this to map the culture of my organization. I would go stop. Uh, I mean, uh, are they running Pioneer Settler Town Plan? And if you said no, okay, well, where are they with their principles? Start with your principles first. I mean, if you want, if you want my advice on culture, um, in terms of, I would do the principles, the doctrine, um, but of course you're going to need some sort of values as well. People always want values. So in which case I would go back to that Oliver S. Curry list of seven values that I did earlier, which is like fairness, reciprocity, put those as your values. You know, we believe in family, we believe in loyalty, we believe in property, we believe in fairness. There's your company values, all seven. Don't mess around with uh, uh, other beliefs and everything else because, you know, uh, just keep it safe. Just sort out your principles, your doctrine. Once you've done that, get your structure in terms of PSD. Once you've done that and you'll be mapping everywhere by then, then we can, then give me a call and then we can start looking at fiddling around with structure. But I wouldn't dive in here. This is more, um, uh, this will take years and years and years. Uh, before this is anywhere near useful, if at all. At that point, okay. it was total silence. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah? But the thing I, I was thinking yeah. is that e each of these dots, and, and maybe, you know, maybe not the values, but let's say a variation of these, because we, we actually saw a lot of maps that represent where we believe the industry is. Don't each of the dots represent the moment where attrition really kicks in? I, up until then, you know, like you said, for example, we have a very good understanding of doctrine, right? It's, it's not only accepted, but it's on the conversion. But you, in fact, when you said, you know, you start with doctrine, that means that as a company, the doctrine is all the way to the left, because we first have to introduce the concept of doctrine, then we have to do it. Then we have to you know, oh. emerge in the practice of it. Eventually, it will stop kind of where you have there. So when you reach oh. there, you know, you reach the moment of attrition. Okay, okay. now I, I, I think I understand. So, so what I'm saying is, oops, I don't want a pen like that. 
Hang on a second. Oh, oh bo, 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 bo. right. So what we're saying is here we've got doctrine, okay? And we've got a lovely table of doctrine, you know, 40 for you to go and do. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that some organization, you know, that concept of principles and doctrine is for them right over there. Okay. Yeah. okay. That, that's no different from, you know, like cloud, you know, compute, you know, servers, computers, utility. And you can bet your bottom dollar that somebody somewhere thinks they've invented compute for the first time ever. Um, uh, and I say that <laughs> laughingly because uh, uh, the last punch card system uh, to be in use was in 2011. So it's only nine years ago. So, um, <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, I'm being a bit extreme, but the point about this is there are always people thinking that they're the first ones to ever have done something uh, and, and not to have learned uh, existing lessons. Uh, that's pretty common. Is that what you're saying? No, no uh, a variation of it. Uh, uh, what I was thinking of is, you know, when you start ZSX, or when you start mapping doc or using doc in an organization. Yeah. And if I look that on that evolution of this, that starts as a concept, right? Even if we, no, let, let's say we take your, your, your definition of doctrine, which I think are, you know, there's no need to invent the wheel on that one. But when you start applying that in an organization, you will start and concept, right? And then it starts to move as we get better, as we apply doctrine, you yeah, start yeah. to look into concept immersion conversion. But I think the interesting point is that we know that the point I was trying to make is that the place where doctrine is today on his map is almost the point of attrition because to, to move it beyond that, it would take such a big amount of effort because it's almost like the thinking is not there or, oh, or the, the practice is not there. I, I see, but eventually- but That's the attrition point. I, okay, I see, today. I see what you mean. Right? Yes. So yes. A lot of value, return of value of investment it's almost like it's very fast to go from concept to conversions on doctrine, but would take a huge amount of effort on an organization to go from conversion to acceptance because the practices and the understanding is um, we're not there yet. I, I, I take you agree. So in terms of that list of table, that, uh, that table of 40 doctrine. Okay. There, people are finding them to be, there people are, as you say, converging on them as being useful but they will modify and change over time as, as more become, you know, um, university applicable principles we become aware of. And so the concept of that doctrine itself will evolve. But for a company that hasn't done any of this stuff at all, then it will seem like com something completely new. And so they will be, over they themselves in the same way that you get people custom building, you know, their own databases uh, or whatever, uh, because they, not just the, you know, the database, the content, uh, uh, but, but the engine, uh, because somebody thinks we can do it better or whatever. Um, so you'll get people, you know, custom building. Oh, I'm sure there must be somebody custom building their own web server somewhere or something. Um, uh, eventually they realize, well, actually it should be over here. That's basically what you're saying. Is that right, or am I still missing the point? Kind. Of. I think I'm not explaining myself very well. I, I, a lot of these things, I, I view that, you know, when something is, let's say the cloud, right? The cloud is a good example. Right? The cloud is today, we can agree, is on a commodity. But the first cloud project, even yeah. when somebody wants to adopt the cloud project, yeah. By, yeah. by proxy, it starts as a genesis. No, on that no, no, no. But the, no. The, no the practices the activity of ah. okay yes so so that uh, really good point so let's uh, let's let's spell that one out uh if i have compute i need to do a blank sheet right did you did you by chance copy that for me you did didn't you yeah yeah i got a screenshot of this of the art. right right so let me um let me switch this off Let's go back to this. Right, uncharted. There we are. Uh, let's come back up here. A oh, whole annotate. Isn't that amazing? I do love Zoom. It's brilliant. Right. So let me erase all of this. And thank you so much.
for copying that. So let's take compute. So we go from compute being Genesis, which is the Z3 in 1943. Custom built systems, Leo, uh, IBM uh, 650, first products, uh, rental services, heading towards commodity hardware, and then you eventually, product and all utility, we've got cloud, okay? So compute itself has evolved, and cloud was really the shift from about here to the shift here. But as a result of that, here's the difference. You have a user has a need, and that need has some sort of, um, we developed good practice for the use of compute as a product. So this was based upon, this is architectural practice, and this is compute. And so we built um, best architectural practice for compute as a product because of a characteristic known as H high MTTR, okay? High mean time to recovery. Now, as we shifted to computers as a utility, obviously we got a lot of emerging practice uh, to do with it having low MTTR. And that emerging practice over time, and that was distributed systems designed for failure, chaos engines, all that sort of stuff, we eventually gave a flag to, we called it DevOps, and it evolved and is heading over, over here now. So it's becoming basically good to best practice for use of computers a utility, whereas um, the past best architectural practice or whatever best practice was for computers a product. Okay, so when we talk about the shift from compute going from product to utility, it's not that this is the genesis of compute, never was. It's all about shift from product to utility. But what it will do is it will create novel practices. Does that make sense? Yeah, and but somebody who's walking on that journey, although, you know, let's say today, they, you know, they're following that footsteps, right? So they're just recreating that journey um, where others have gone before, but they're just going from, they start yeah. on in their organization and they go all the way to commodity, but they can do that very fast because we already figure out how to get there. Yeah, so DevOps today, as I have drawn on here, DevOps today is now, you know, good heading towards best, uh, whereas DevOps, in 2008 was the genesis of it and this is compute as a utility so ec2 so it's 2006 and this is compute as a as a product as a product okay and so the point about this is the danger here is that people go oh cloud is new as in it's a new emerging thing and everything else no it's still compute it's just the utility version of it what's emerging and new are the practices by which we build on top, okay? Yep. And the distinction it matters. Why does it matter? Why do we care about that distinction? We care about that distinction because one of the, the major sources of inertia are the pre-existing practices, uh, pre-existing capital, as in I've got great big data centers I've spent hundreds of millions on, and also, more importantly, um, the pre-existing practices. God, that's dreadful. Let's draw that again. One of these days, I'm going to go and take some art lessons. Art is so important. Thank you, John, for that pointer. Um, so these pre-existing practices, um, we eventually called legacy. So best practice for use of computers as a product is what we now call legacy. Whereas good practice for computers and utility is DevOps. And eventually that will become best practice. And eventually we won't care because up here is the runtime and that's all shifting to a utility. So anybody caring about any of this stuff down below, uh, you know, you're into hiding for nothing because none of it matters. We only care about the code and the bar. And that's why DevOps is already legacy. And DevOps, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid DevOps, all of this stuff down here, you know, Kubernetes, the whole lot, um, it doesn't matter um, because we're shifting up the stack.
But the point that I want to emphasize is the act itself has evolved. And so this is why in 2005, we were able to say, look, compute's going to a utility. And why in Ubuntu in 2008, we said, look, compute's going to a utility. We're going to get these new emerging practices established. We don't know what they are. Now, it wasn't called DevOps at the time, but whatever anybody working in this space, invest in those companies and get them running on Ubuntu. Okay, we want to own this space completely because eventually it will become the dominant space. And we want to make sure that Ubuntu's there uh, and everybody else isn't. Okay, and now if you are playing that game today, you know, the runtime is heading towards a utility, it's a lambda. And so I, I can't draw up the map, but you're going to get the same co evolved practices going on. Uh, and so we're seeing entire new security practices and new development practices all around this serverless space. And so all this mm -hmm. stuff underneath here will just become irrelevant. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You sure? Are you sure? You disagree? You don't have to agree with me. It's a map. The whole purpose of the map <laughs> is to bloody disagree. If you don't agree, tell me, no, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, all maps are imperfect representations of the space. Man, really, uh, go on, it's, go on. it's a really good point. Um, if you share a map that nobody actually disagrees with you, is that a problem? Oh, if you share a map that nobody disagrees with you, is it a problem? What an interesting idea. Um, well, there could be two reasons that nobody disagrees with you. Uh, one, they, are, they don't feel safe enough to disagree with you. And this goes back to the whole sort of culture, psychological safely, because one of the doctrine is to challenge assumptions. Okay. So if I go back to my um, let me let me delete this. Hang on. Uh, let me clear this. Clear all drawings. If I go back to my map of culture. You see, I've got. Um, if you look down, you see where I've got doctrine there. Um, and there's a link between doctrine and psychological uh, and psychological safety. The reason, uh, well, there's safety, there's many forms, but there's psychological safety. The reason for this is um, one of the doctrine is challenge assumptions. And of course, people can't challenge assumptions uh, unless they feel safe to do so. So one of, your, one of your issues is that people may not be challenging you um, because they don't feel safe. A second issue is there's a lack of diversity of opinion. Uh, one of the critical things, if you look at C.S. Collins' work, if you want to make systems resilient, you need engineering and ecological resilience. So you basically, um, uh, you've got to build, uh, resilience is all about the ability of a system to adapt to, to changes. Uh, John Allspun is well worth uh, uh, following on this sort of stuff. Um, but the, um, the critical thing there is, is that, um, in, Ecosystem resilience requires um, uh, diversity. So, so one problem is people aren't challenging you because they're frightened to challenge. You don't have the psychological safety. No one feels okay with challenge. The second problem is you may lack diversity in your organization, diversity in those different viewpoints. And that, that's critically essential if you want to survive long term. Um, and the third, I suppose, option is that actually everybody agrees because it's a good enough common image or explanation of the space. Um, I, I'm guessing. So those are the three um, that I would put down. Others may say there's more. Where is that would, a you, put, uh, where would mm -hmm. you put bias in? In which category? Is that merely a, a matter of lack of diversity? Oh, so bias, you're looking, if you're looking doctrine, in phase one, I've got to um, uh, remove uh, bias and duplication. So I, I, I look at removing bias and duplication as a, as a standard principle. And are you assuming, Simon, that people, because the doctrine is established and the common language is there, people already understand, they know how to read it and they have the context to interpret it properly, before, you know, to then be able to other choose to challenge or not challenge it. 
exactly. So that, that's a really, you know, this, this map, it has my assumptions on it. And my assumptions, of course, uh, are influenced by my own biases. So, um, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable challenge you've just made. Uh, and just uh, translate that, what you're basically saying, if I understand you correctly, is this doctrine here may actually be a lot less evolved than I think it is. Is that, you know, and I think like, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable point. I mean, um, I put, well, I thought we were converging on doctrine, um, <laughs> but then, you know, I, I find it almost depressing actually when I when I look at the you look at the doctrine table. I have like the phase one things, and they're things like know your users, know your user needs, challenge assumptions, have a common language, remove bias and duplication, understand the landscape, the environment you're looking at, know the detail. And you look at those and go, oh come on, everybody must do that. And I, I am constantly disappointed by how they are enormous revelations uh, to some companies. It's just like, really? <laughs> so yeah, if you're going to challenge me and say, I think your doctrine is a lot more emerging than it is converging, I, 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 um, yeah, I could well accept that. Uh, I wasn't challenging that. I was saying a reason for somebody to not... Um have a problem with the map could be due to a lack of uh, understanding, a lack of interpretation, a lack they're not equipped to actually read it effectively. Um, but I mean, if, if you don't make the assumption that the person understands the doctrine first before they try to interpret the map, uh, then, then you're going nowhere. So I'm just saying, is that one of the assumptions that you oh, need to make first? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I said I would talk about the, the mapping of culture. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the thing about them is I'm, I'm, I'm very uncertain about it at the moment and I'm still refining it. And, you know, I remember it took me, um, you know, when I started mapping in 2005, um, you know, I used to talk about it at uh, a few conferences and places, but I was convinced that everybody else had their own method of mapping because that's what you obviously learn at MBA schools. It took me at least six years to start realizing actually people really are making decisions without understanding their landscape. And, yeah. you know, because that's like, that's a real shock. It's like, oh, what are you basing it upon then? I um, mean, SWAT diagrams, you know, like a coin in the air. I mean, what is it? I mean, um, uh, so, so it was a real shock. So I, I tend to be quite slow about this stuff. And so I've been noodling with this one for, a, um, uh, for a, quite a bit of time. I'm probably going to noodle for a lot longer before I'm comfortable. Um, but despite well, the fact- Iterative, right? Yeah, exactly. So I share it so that people can give a challenge and tell me. And so there's a couple of things. One is the art. Uh, another thing is like the, uh, the doctrine. I mean, itself, you know, really, is it converging? Am I deluding myself there? Do I have my own bias? Uh, possible, possible. Other comments? I think we ended up having some interesting uh, cross chatter in the uh, in the chat for a moment. Oh, sorry about about privacy and and um, different rights, but kind of based on what what was being said previously. So I'm not I'm not sure about other questions. Someone had asked um, if. If it, it says, have any of your buds ma mapped culture? Oh, Cat Sweetle, fantastic. Um, yes. Hello, Cat. Oh, fabulous. Um, she's still there. I'm here. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, 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 good. I, I, I saw the quote about uh, Wardley maps does not, uh, Wardley mapping does not equal what. Thank you, by the way. Um, I, I totally agree. Um, so, have any of your back bugs culture? Sorry, I need my glasses on. I keep on forgetting I'm practically blind, but there we are. Um, 
Oh, I am blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, the maps culture. Uh, compare culture maps with anyone. If so, major points of disagreement or divergence. Well, that's interesting. I mean, um, so individual components. So, you know, on the maps, I have like values and I have doctrine. So individual components can be entire tables. So I have the doctrine table, which I use to compare uh, different companies. And I actually, doctrine is really useful in many different ways because if somebody's doctrine is terrible, um, as in it's read all over the place, chances are uh, they've definitely not heard of mapping in any way, a shape or form. Uh, they really don't understand the landscape at all. I know that if it's read all over the place, which means when it comes to gameplay, I can do whatever I feel like because they're not going to see it coming and, and there's nothing they can do anyway because they won't understand it. So when it comes to gameplay, I can go absolute town, run right with these people, build, you know, play ecosystem models, undermine their constraints, do open plays against them. You can just drive these people into the ground if you're feeling evil. Um, so it's so a great fun and because because they don't understand the spec. Now, when it comes to values, in the way I showed you earlier, you can map values as well. So the interesting thing about doing that sort of thing is you start to look at you know what is culturally acceptable within one collective, uh, what are the values within one, and compare them to another. And so you can start to do evil things or possibly good things depending on your inclination. Um, so you could look to undermine a specific collective if its values uh, don't align with, um, say, a, a, another collective, a nation state. Or what you try and do um, is if you've got a collective in a certain nation and the collective has certain values you don't like, then you try and associate that collective with other values, which is not like within the wider collective as in the nation. So th th you could do that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, do I uh, do it in anger and aggressively against there? No, I'm still noodling in this space because I, I find it quite a dangerous space, but there we are. Are we missing Simon's other session? Am I doing two sessions? No, 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 this is good. I think, not sure what was that about. This oh. is, you're, you're in the right place. I'm in the right place. The right uh, place. It, it's not beyond me to be in the wrong place. Uh, there we are. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, let's have a look. Which other ones have we got? Uh, look, blah, 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 There's blah, supposed blah, to be blah, another blah. session on terrorism at three. Am I? No, I don't think so, really. All right. Well, let me have a look. Let me have a look. I'm, uh, I've got one on mapping culture, and then I've got team topologies. PST scores yeah. and tribes. Aha. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, that's a five. That's a five. Right, hang on a second. I've completely missed my chat window now. What have I done with it? Uh, oh, it's over here. Got it. Right, super duper. Um, the rest are kind of just speculations on different things. For clarity, that's right. So we had some cross chatter, but. Okay, boo, for clarity, retrospectively, Dominic Cummings was on screen at the point. I think the Dominic Cummings one is really interesting uh, because on one side, you've got him taking actions which obviously don't fit in with the behavior and the values of the collective as in uh, the conservative party. Um, on the other side, you've got this issue of, uh, um, you know, they don't want to admit to being wrong or failing or you know, very much Boris who doesn't want to be associated with that uh, being wrong because that undermines his position. That then gets, you know, stuck into memory. Well, Boris was wrong on this or they were wrong on that. So, so they want to carefully avoid that. But at the same time, it undermines other people within the collective, their feeling of safety, you know, like, you know, what is our collective about if we're not even going to stand up for our values? So you, you had this interesting sort of race condition or not. And the more pressure that was piled on, you know, uh, from the public, the uh, more difficult position that, uh, uh, that Boris was put in, and the more that the Conservative MPs started uh, calling this out. Um, and it was, it was a really interesting sort of race condition, which needed something to misdirect or take the focus off it, or, you know, you just try and ignore it until it dies down. 
Um, unfortunately, something else, well, uh, unfortunately, in a good way, uh, 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 something else happened which has taken the focus for them of that particular issue. And I say in a good way because it's actually a, on a, on a very positive thing. Um, okay, uh, could you consider design as an element of culture? You know, design and art. Um, We appear defining design. We hear perspective defining design as the future differentiation of success in companies, or is it emerging doctrine? Oh, oh. Um, design itself. Um, well, I'm going to play with the idea of art and the concept of art and beauty within that map because they, they seem to be real central type concepts. Um, design itself. Uh, I'm going to leave leave that to others. Because yeah, I um, uh, um, it's not I, not a strong place for me to be. Um, are we missing Simon's other session? Nope. Social structural security and social engineering as a function of big data has the answer only in privacy and paying for services versus using free software, free services with ads. Okay. That's all kind of cross chatter by this point. Um, oh, no, no, no. I, I missed this conversation. <laughs> it's a shame. Shame people weren't having this conversation out loud. Um, so that's an interesting one. Because we're paying for a service. Personally. Well, first of all, we're all paying for a service. So something like Facebook is not free. You're paying for it. You're paying for it with your data uh, and yourself and how they advertise. And do they manipulate you? Well, yes. And we know they do. Um, it's been clear, and they do. I mean, uh, um, so you, yes, you are paying, and you are paying to be exploited. Um, is there something we can do to counter that sort of, well, from a government perspective? I mean, there's a whole group looking at uh, issues of online harm, and that, that's got to consider not only, you know, in legislation what we can do, but maybe there are other mechanisms, maybe yeah, it's like race condition of bots. Is there a way of using the same tools to counteract some of its harmful impacts? I don't know. Uh, I think the combination of privacy focus and paying for services, okay. Open source model will guide the change as well as, uh... oh, so this goes back to the interesting, uh, the tool which was, um, Oh, Denise, if you're on uh, well, the open source tool, which was doing the tracking and tracing of people. Yeah, the COVID safe path apps. Yeah, which is also exploitable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you right, are you referring to agreeing to a task, term of service? Uh, da, da, da. Extent that, um, okay. Other questions to ask Simon? Thoughts on mapping culture and infosec, given too often it is provided as oversimplistic and non-descriptive explanation for security failures. Oh, oh gosh, what a question that is. So um, uh, many organizations, I, I love this, this sort of like, um, I have this cartoon uh, that I put together, which is basically, uh, um, I, I should have used it, it's uh, Lego characters. Uh, one is Darth Vader, and one is uh, a policeman, and uh, and basically um, um, uh, it, it's a constant exercise of um, you know uh, the Death Star has been destroyed. We will build the new Death Star and learn the lessons from the past. And then it goes on, you know, the Death Star has been destroyed for the eleventh time. We will build a new Death Star and learn the lessons from the past. The point about this being is we never learn the lessons from the past. So, so the interesting thing about uh, doing post-mortem, um, I'm a great believer in doing pre-mortem and then post-mortem. So pre-mortem being um, uh, you map out a space that you're going to change and then you do the uh, post-mortem, but you've also got the map that you had to begin with. And so you use the map to help learn what actually changed them from that. You learn basic patterns. Now, in some cases, you don't, don't have the system for doing, uh, uh, you, there was never, you know, you never did uh, a scenario plan on this sort of attack or whatever it happens to be. So you don't have a map, you haven't gone through that process, that's okay. 
But nonetheless, if you're going to learn about the environment, um, I, from my point of view, it would be essential to, you know, even if we've had an attack, is to go through and map the space and have a look at like now things like doctrine. Um, blaming cultures are really interesting. We've got a lousy sort of culture. Um, because, you know, people can't define culture anyway. Um, you know, that was the point of Kroger's work, is that there is no definition of co culture. So it's like one of these terrible terms, uh, like innovation, which has become, you know, sort of a catch-all, sort of meaningless, you know. Oh, you know, we need innovation, whatever that means. Um, and it's a world of difference between genesis and product to commodity. They will call them both innovation. Well, our problem is our culture. Well, what does that mean? I mean, even anthropologists can't even tell us what culture is. And literally, they've been trying for 100 years. So, um, yeah, I, um, I, my thoughts on mapping culture is I would start by first mapping the landscape and understanding your doctrine. Um, I, I, I wouldn't worry too much about getting into mapping culture itself. Um, given that, you know, the field is just not there at the moment. Well, maybe it is, I don't know, we're still exploring. Uh, Nick Perry, yes, I have concluded that the engagement activity metrics matter more to them as an advertising platform than the experience of all users. Oh, hang on, do you have any thoughts on why Twitter doesn't do more to combat bots? Um... Gosh, that's a tough one. Um, I think they do, but it's a race condition, isn't it? Because it's a bit like um, uh, uh, the whole Bitcoin uh, type thing, because uh, there's a race condition going on all the time to, you know, people trying to identify who owns what, uh, uh, you know, who, who a Bitcoin address belongs to. And of course, then there's that race condition of the privacy side with all the different flushing services and everything else. So you've got a constant war going on because so Bitcoin, other than being a dreadful mechanism for burning the planet, is just, just a way of a bunch of people to, to hide, hide money uh, whilst claiming to be public. Uh, it, it's um, because ownership is anonymized and, or can be hidden because of all the services that are created. So I imagine it's the same here, race condition. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, Twitter is constantly trying to find ways of uh, stopping these uh, uh, bot networks and at the same time all these bot networks are trying to find ways of getting past whatever measure they put in place. But if you map the way a human behaves and the way a bot behaves, they yeah. have been mapped. And because I've done this before in the past, I did a project where we were actually were graphing and we can have mapped, it's actually the solution that we came up with only work when we apply context, although I didn't have the, the, the mapping reference that I have now. But we, we found really great correlation between um, uh, bots that behave like humans but didn't behave like other humans. So it's very easy to create a bot like you know that talks and, and, and talks to itself and behaves in a certain way. It's very hard to do one that uh, behaves like the other humans that you see in the platform. Okay, there's a terrible echo on your line. I don't know if it's just me. Oh, sorry. Is that, is that better? Oh, yeah, suddenly, suddenly I can hear you. You sound sorry. like you are, you are far away in a sort of deep cave with fog. And, uh, and anyway, so not, not, not that I know what fog sounds like. But anyway, yes. So, what I was saying is that if you map the humans yeah. and you map the bots, they will have very different shapes. Yeah. The way the way they will operate, the way the timings that they will do, the signals that you get from bots are very different. And it's it's easy to create bots that look like a human, but yeah. in fact, you 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 can tell already. Like in fact, you know, a lot of these ones, you, you see a little bit of a bot activity, and you can already tell that this is not human. This is a bot, right? But if you, I, I think your culture map is actually quite interesting, because if you apply some of those behaviors to a bot, uh, and then to humans. Uh, this is my hypothesis because I haven't done that for Twitter, but you, you should have lots of correlations and you should be able to pick up a lot of those things. And more importantly, you should be able to pick up the similar networks that exist. One of the things we found out was really amazing was that you, we found patterns that then only exist in bots. 
So even if the first pods were had to be discovered manually, either because you spotted or because they became weaponized, so in this case it was to send spam, for example, mm -hmm. um, you can then go back and look at the patterns of activity, map how they behave in, you know, and then look for similar patterns. And then you had a big success rate in finding other bots. And this is an economic game. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, About sure. making it expensive for the bot creators mm -hmm. um, to create those bots. Mm -hmm. and, and isn't that something that, you know, Twitter could do more? Um, and Facebook, which of course is against their business model, but ignoring. <laughs> yeah, why would Twitter want to get rid of bots? Why would Facebook want to get rid of bots, right? Like if that it's, premise is damage. Yeah, but it's, it's an existential threat to the platform. So is if you it? look at MySpace, yes. If you look at MySpace, MySpace was destroyed by bots. Was and, it? And, actually, and, and some users that behave like bots. Right. What does that last one mean, Dennis? Some users that behave like bots. Well, because the, what, the other problem that you have is that there's a fine line between sometimes your power users and your bots and your malicious users. So sometimes the problem you have in some of these platforms, and not just social media platforms, is that your worst offenders, even from a security point of view, are the ones you make the most money from. But it's the tragedy of the commons sometimes because they're the ones who bring the platform down. Kat, what do you think? I think that we are creating a system that then acts on us. And so even without anyone having the intent to like exploit the system, any human actor having that intent, it would be expected for our behaviors to converge at some point with the bots or become closer together because we are creating a system that then is acting on us and then we're acting on the system. And so at some point, especially when you factor in social acceleration, it becomes a crystallization, right? Yes. I am. Um, uh, so if I go back to the bot example uh, I was talking about earlier, is uh, if you look at something like Scum Media, which is like the fake news, you know, defund the BBC and everything else, it seems to have started in principle just with bots. And then as people have got sucked into it, not only have they got radicalized, people have started to take over and they seem to be doing the radicalization now. Um, so, in, <laughs> so you've got this idea that the bot is just a seeding, um, just seeding up a system. Uh, which eventually becomes populated by humans acting you know, in the same way the bots were, to drag in more people and radicalize them. And if you do that on scale between the systems, does it then become a, become a threat to the entire system? Of is, course is, is, Yeah. Like yeah. the ditting that you were describing earlier, right? Where I say one thing and you say something that's a little bit bigger or bolder, right? Like we humans have been doing that for always. Has mm -hmm. anyone ever gone fishing? Like this is the thing that we do, right? But now we've removed physical proximity as a constraint for that. So it's no longer that I need to be physically located with someone or I need to physically move my body. I've removed physical proximity and the physical transport of goods and myself as a constraint for that. So now that ditting behavior can be magnified uh, because it's separated from time place, right? And so it can become uh, rapidly accelerated and suddenly it's this crystallization, right? But it's that bot behavior, right? Where you're encouraging that is not something that's new. It's something that we have always done. It's that now we've removed physical proximity, physical place as a constraint to that. And that means that we've also removed the pressure uh, that comes with being physically located with other human beings, right? That it, it's really difficult to get so homogenous, but in a place, in a, a non-physical place, in a virtual place, we can create highly homogenous places that, that crystallize very easily. And there's no pressure of having uh, physical proximity, which just comes with some heterogeneity. 
Hey, that's brilliant. Thank you. And I think also to add to that, um, the difficulty of finding the areas that have become so, um, so homogenous in a radicalized way. I mean, in a sense, you would think it would be easy, but you have a lot more people than to contend with after all the bots have talked with all the people and the people have talked with the bots and there's not really a way to get down to, okay, where was this actually coming from anymore? I mean, mm. it kind of fills everything. It's not One like we're chasing. One fish climbs up to the other fish and says, hey, how's the water today? And the other fish says, what the hell is water? Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, mm, mm. gosh, interesting. Uh, it's interesting from the point of view of um, uh, not only what's going on with bots, and I, I do like that connection to proximity. Thank you. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that before. Oh, I hadn't come across that one before. So that proximity is a, is a great one. Um, but it's also, you know, it, it, can this be used in positive ways as well? Um, can That's exactly, what I'm curious about. Yeah. Can we use the same instruments and techniques and the same sort of box rather than create, you know, because they're feeding and creating, uh, pushing people in a particular direction. Can they be pushed in another? We already know that people can be influenced by micro narratives. We know that from, uh, you know, all the way back to the Romanian study. So, um, Da, 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 da. Um, and maybe, maybe government just needs to get better at oh, oh, <laughs> doing bot networks or <laughs> maybe the government's the wrong wrong people to choose. Okay. Good. Gosh, lots to think about. Um, uh, which do you think is evolving faster? Bots or average users' awareness of bots and their ability to identify bots for themselves? Um, I think it's hard to identify what is a bot today. Um, but I can't imagine that that's, that's increasing and anything that's decreasing. Are people aware of um, uh, they're being surrounded by bots? I, I think there's two sides to that is are they aware and do they care? So um, uh, what do I think is evolving faster, bots or average users' awareness of bots and their ability to identify? I think the bot, if I, I'm going to be brief, I think the bot networks are evolving faster than us. Uh, is somebody going to take a different viewpoint, challenge me, tell me I'm wrong there? No, I, I think you're right, but I, I think, I don't, I don't think we, we have engaged effectively on on that model because the companies faced with the biggest bots at, at least the visible ones again is there is on on their commercial interest there's lots of organizations there's a lot of companies who have solved the problem with bots um because they they were aligned with solving the problem so for example there was there's lots of fraud you know the companies who got hit with fraud with bots they address it very very effectively because they find ways to game the system in a way that the humans play well and the bots um, become really expensive to create. Okay, um, so uh, an example thing? Um, so for example, on, um, on companies where you can create accounts to cap points, where you know, you, you, if you create hundreds of thousands of, you know, hundreds of, thousands of accounts, you can have them bouncing off each other. You get more and more points because each one referenced each other. And then, you know, you, you basically can take money out of the system. So a simple example is if, if I get 10 points for every person that I recommend and I get, you know, and I, I give a voucher code to another a thousand of my bots, I'm going to get 10,000 points. Mm -hmm. Then I use my 10,000 points to convert that to a product, which I can take off the system, which basically means that now, there is a financial fraud of the company. Okay, so but this is an example where they have a commercial interest. Uh, there is a financial reason for limiting the behavior of the bots. But the problem with Twitter and other systems is what we're talking about is radicalization of people 
in, in, in terms of uh, their messaging, their viewpoints, their values of things. And that doesn't impact Twitter one way or the other. It has no financial impact on them. Oh, no, it has a positive impact on Twitter. Uh, does it have it a make, but, any impact? No, it, it, Twitter, they make money with the bots because the bots increase traffic of Twitter. And they increase the activity and the engagement that happens within Twitter. So, so, so that's a good example. Right? So if you now have um, a seed of, um, of, let's say, a channel or a community that was recreated initially by bots, and then it bots eventually can phase out a little bit because the community now has momentum by itself, all those users probably would not be as engaged if it wasn't for the bots or that generation of activity in the first place. Okay, so I must wait. I don't know the, uh, the, the, the economics of this because on one side, you're going to have a volume of traffic, but then on the other side, you're going to have reduction in quality of the traffic because more of the traffic is actually bots rather than individuals. So I don't know how that works out, whether it's actually beneficial for them or not. No, but it wasn't that model that, like you said, after a while, the actually own humans involved are the ones doing the radicalization. They, they already become a self-sufficient community. I mean, I, somebody... They generate traffic by itself. And they increase the usage of Twitter. So they increase the use of social networks because, you know, they generate that energy. It's, it's like Reddit. If you, it's amazing. If you read the, how Reddit started, initially it was just them talking to each other. Okay. Until, until a community became self-sufficient and they didn't have to keep seeding it. But every now and then you have to go and pump energy into communities because or else the community dies. And if the community dies, traffic goes down. So you need a constant stream. Like you said, you, know, you need people being liking each other. You need that constant dopamine effect of feedback, loop validation, etc. And also because there's isolation of community groups, actually a lot of activity in one place doesn't actually affect other groups because they don't see that. Fortunately, I'm not an anthropologist or a, a sociologist, so I know what I don't know what I'm talking about, as in I don't know what I'm talking about within this field. So I'm now going to use that as an excuse, because I've only got four minutes left, to open up my slides again and go back to my map. So other than the art, which is obviously one I've got to put on here as well, and obviously other than moving a couple of the terms, are there any other comments on this? Remember, I'm still very undecided about this. Um, I, I, I'm finding it a little bit helpful uh, in get, getting me to think about the links and connections between things. But has anybody else tried any of this stuff? What, what's their thought to be? I think there's something about being an agent in a complex adaptive system, which kind of follows on previous discussion about Twitter and the the excuse that he used to move on was this idea my, my area is really mapping and user needs and if you look at Twitter the user needs that they're satisfying are advertisers not the users yeah now if we look ahead at the idea that bots are going to become commonplace yeah so autonomous agents etc and this idea of disintermediation where even Amazon will disappear. It then becomes that your identity is the thing that has value, your self-sovereign identity, and you can have multiple identities. Yeah. So then it's 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 about being able to validate or verify an identity with somebody like Twitter. And there are levels of agents within a network. So there are humans, which we know about then we may have bots, which could be fact checkers or news gatherers or mm -hmm. summarizers. They will have a purpose, but at the moment they're being used for mischief. Yeah. Good. Good comment. Gosh, we do one. Yes. We do have one more in the, uh, in the chat here. It says, um, an interesting counterexample would be something like stack, stack Overflow. Their traffic actually depends on the quality of traffic, and they're darn good at finding and fixing bot rings. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's a good point, yeah. Um, any, any other? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've got a question for you on this, on this particular map, if I may. 
if I'm reading all the components, they all, you know, I, I feel like I've got enough context, enough understanding. I can, I can, I can see, you know, I can understand them and why they are where they are with, with an exception of one, which is the hero's component which, you know, it's a conversation that I had quite recently with Dennis around how the more heroics there are in the organization, you know, the, it's a bad sign, right? It's a, you know, it's a warning sign, the more heroics there are. But could you just almost expand on that very briefly, kind of like a brain dump on your, on your thoughts, almost as if you broke that up into another map, just, yeah, just a bit brief on that particular component, hero. Uh, so basically, uh, when I was actually doing that, I was uh, looking at memory. And it was, you know, how do we store uh, the organizational collective memory? Uh, so we have symbols, um, uh, we have rituals, and then we often have stories about heroes. So heroes that, uh, you know, show us a set of values uh, or a story which emphasizes a certain type of behavior. And um, obviously rituals, Sometimes they report, uh, reinforce a particular type of behavior. Sometimes they, you know, they're useful for getting us into a particular mental mode. Um, and sometimes they're just rituals which um, historically made sense, but have somehow just continued to last. And, um, but you know, it's, again, they can help in belonging. And then we have symbols as well. And, and I just purely uh, where these single nodes, where I put them, here on the evolution axis uh, was was really about you know, how how well understood are these concepts? You know, and, um, the idea of heroes, you know, generally well understood, it's accepted type thing. We have it in many many different collectives. Uh, the same with rituals, but but slightly less so, and the same with symbols, and slightly less so. That's all that's supposed to represent. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. And uh, it certainly doesn't mean it's right. As I said, you know, what I was aiming to do or what I wanted to do was explore this idea of culture. I had a very simplistic idea of what culture was. And uh, uh, it turns out, you know, my, uh, as per usual, when I come up with my ideas, I find out they're gibberish pretty quickly. Um, uh, and, but then I hit this problem that I couldn't find anybody who could explain culture. And then I hit the problem and discovered that uh, anthropologists have been looking, trying to explain culture for a hundred years and they cannot agree on it. And then I hit the Margaret Mead problem, which was the issue with language. And so at that point that I started this journey of trying to map it. Um, now, you know, the value of maps is whether it's useful. I, I, it's helped me try to understand connections between things. It's not there yet. Um, um, but then, as I said, it, took, it takes me years and years and years before I feel comfortable with something. So I just wanted to show and see what people thought. And uh, uh, thank you very much for the comments. Uh, but it, that art one, I need to finish that one off. So thank you. No, brilliant. Yeah, it's All right. awesome to see. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, oh, we're over time.